Hello, I'm John Carvilla, and uh, this is a video capsule looking at the Echelon 1 clinical trial data in Hodgkin's lymphoma that was recently presented at the ASCO 2022 and EHA meetings. Here are my disclosures. By way of introduction, let's uh, spend the next couple of minutes looking at the treatment of advanced stage Hodgkin's lymphoma. In general, uh, there are a number of different ways that we can approach uh, the treatment of stage three or stage four classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. Over the past 10 years or so, while this has remained ABVD based, increasingly uh, clinicians in Canada particularly are embracing the use of interim FDG PET scanning, uh, where based on the trial data from the Raffle study in the UK, escalation to escalated BCOP in patients that are PET2 positive has been demonstrated to be of benefit in the advanced stage setting. In addition, the alternative uh, approach would be to potentially start with escalated BCOP and use a de-escalation approach either to ABVD uh, based on the uh, LISA AHL 2011 clinical trial or to potentially reduce the number of cycles of escalated BCOP as was uh, tested in the German Hodgkin study group HD18 clinical trial. I've also highlighted here that uh, FDG PET adaptation is also used in a localized disease setting, but that's not really our focus for this presentation today. The tension in Canada is how to use these three different clinical trial platforms to direct our practice. And in part, this may be used by the identification of higher risk disease at baseline. The international prognostic score has been available now for well over 20 years. And we know patients with a score of three or higher tend to do not as well uh, with standard ABVD. This does represent a minority of patients, somewhere in the range of 15 to 20% of advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma, though that may vary on the series. Additionally, we know PET2 can also stratify, stratify patients for poor risk outcome, and in PET positive patients, thankfully this as well is an uncommon phenomenon, typically occurring again about 20% uh, of patients. Now, my last comment here is that radiation therapy uh, in the advanced stage setting, which was not typically employed in Canada, again, is used even less, though in patients with residual PET positive uh, partial response, this can be consolidated uh, with uh, radiotherapy uh, based on data most recently published from the Italians. So here are the three different uh, curative approaches using conventional therapies, the Rathel study on the, on the left based on ABVD, the LISA study showing de-escalation potentially to ABVD following escalated BCOP, and the German Hodgkin study group HD18 study again, potentially de-escalating to fewer cycles of treatment, all showing excellent results. The echelon one curves on the right, I've shown the five-year progression-free survival that was reported by David Strauss in the Lancet Hematology last year, again, showing the significant benefit, about 7% in PFS for BV, AVD over ABVD. It's important to recognize these are four different clinical trials and the patient populations are not the same. Importantly, the two in the middle, the uh, uh, European trials that started with escalated BCOP did not include patients over the age of 60, uh, who are some of the most difficult patients to cure with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And these patient populations were included in Rathel as well as the Echelon 1 study. Looking at interim PET positive disease here, what you can show is the impact of the biomarker on an outcome. Uh, on the left, the Rathel study did not randomize patients, but uh, assigned uh, PET positive patients to receive BCOP uh, in the escalated uh, schedule or BCOP 14, again, showing <clears throat> favorable results compared to historical controls. Uh, the AHL 2011 and HD18 data, uh, again, do show the impact of uh, PAD outcome. Uh, this uh, is significant in the AHL 2011 data, but you see it starts to disappear a little bit in the HD18 uh, trial, looking at uh, potentially escalated BCOP being a platform where PET2 positivity, uh, if you continue to six cycles of treatment, does not appear to be a stronger predictor of outcome. You can see in the non-randomized patients, uh, the uh, inferior five-year PFS. Looking at echelon 14, and you see the best outcome, sorry, echelon one, again, you can see the most favorable outcomes in the patients that are uh, PET2 negative, uh, though, again, looking at the PET2 positive populations, the two lower curves, you do see uh, an improvement in approximately 15% there, 60% uh, uh, five-year PFS with BVABD versus 46% with ABVD. 
again, bringing the point here that with the novel therapy Brentuximab added, uh, the patients with uh, PET2 positive disease do have a more favorable outcome compared to uh, typical chemotherapy. How do we make these choices when integrating these data for the patient uh, sitting in front of us looking to be cured with Hodgkin's lymphoma? There are multiple factors at play here. Uh, the potential of cure and the trade-offs of what PFS uh, over the first few years of the disease may mean versus longer-term overall survival when we start to worry about the impact of late effects, particu particularly second malignancies and cardiac toxicity. I think we all have experiences with the acute uh, toxicities of more intensive chemotherapy regimens. And so this is an issue with uh, the difficulties of febrile neutropenia and the management around uh, more GI toxicity, et cetera. Uh, but this is all certainly done through the lens of uh, clinicians that have a lot of experience uh, both within their uh, own personal practice as well as the practice in their institutions, where historically uh, the backbone of ABVD has been our gold standard in Canada. It's important to highlight that all of these platforms are successful for the majority. And as I've shown you earlier, the cross-trial comparisons are challenging because these are uh, clinical trials that were done independently and the patient populations may not be exactly the same. We still struggle with the uh, goal of individualizing patients because there is uh, the potential to both over and under treat patients when we don't know specifically how to direct treatment in an individual patient. Lastly, overall survival in Hodgkin's lymphoma studies has been really challenging to show over the past two decades. And that's partly because the trials are not powered to look at overall survival in general and partly because we know that there are a number of additional strategies that may be effective in the second line setting, such as salvage therapy and transplantation, and more recently, uh, the application of novel therapies such as checkpoint inhibitors and antibody drug conjugates that are uh, both moving forward earlier in the treatment landscape. And lastly, in the clinic, we all like the idea that we want our treatments to be as simple as possible, and can we minimize the complexity around decision-making, which I think for all of us would, uh, would be very appealing as managing patients is difficult enough on its own. Now to move on to the clinical trial, these are the data that were presented by Steve Ansel uh, at the ASCO 2022 meeting, which is an updated analysis of uh, Echelon 1 looking at overall survival. As a reminder, um, the phase three Echelon 1 study had a five-year follow-up that demonstrated the long-term PFS benefit of the experimental arm uh, Brentuximab, Vidotin plus ABVD versus ABVD. Here, this is an alpha controlled pre specified overall survival analysis of Echelon 1. So, what this means is this was a planned look, and they actually spent statistical power to look at the impact. And they're going to look at overall survival along with some other key endpoints, second malignancies, pregnancies, and long term outcome of peripheral neuropathy. Again, here's the study schema. So, this was a one to one randomization of the experimental arm incorporating BB instead of bleomycin versus the control arm of ABVD, uh, over 1,300 patients randomized at the end of treatment. Uh, again, imaging was performed to confirm complete remission. Uh, there was an end of cycle two PET scan, which was scored by Deauville, uh, but was not uh, a basis for treatment decision. Though, of course, if you had progressive disease, you could come off study and then follow up every three months uh, for the first three years and then every six months. The primary endpoint has been discussed in many meetings previously was modified progression-free survival, which incorporated the idea that patients that did not achieve a remission were able to receive additional therapy. This was called a progression event, which is not a standard progression uh, definition, but is a very clinically meaningful endpoint from all of our perspectives. Here are the key, key patient characteristics. Again, just to highlight a couple of key points. As I mentioned earlier, that there were patients over the age of 60 included in this study. And while the median is, again, young, as Hodgkin studies tend to be at 35 to 36, uh, you can see that 14% of the population was over the age of 60. Uh, stage three and four population uh, in this trial, two thirds of the patients were stage four. Looking at the risk based on the IPS score, only 20% were a score of zero to one. The majority, a little over 50% being two to three with the remainder 25% being high risk with a score of four or greater. PET2 positivity in this trial appeared to be a little bit lower than other uh, prior experiences with only 8% of patients being PET2 positive. So here's the uh, overall survival Kaplan-Meier plot here. 
So there is a significant improvement with a hazard ratio of 0.59. So that means a 41% reduction in risk of death compared to the control arm of ABVD. Uh, looking at the six-year overall survival rate, so for a brentuximab in combination with ABVD, that's 93.9% versus 89.4%. And again, with the hazard ratio, you can see the p-value there is very statistically significant. Looking at the forest plot here, so the overall survival benefits were uh, consistent across multiple subgroups, as you can see. Um, the hazard ratios all sort of tend towards favoring ABD. We start to lose statistical power when we look at specific subsets in general. As you can see, though, the trend is heading the right way in patients over the age of 60, over the age of 45, regardless of region. Uh, the effect size appears to be more prominent as the IPS risk factors go up again, more prominent in stage four disease. And as you can see, even more prominent in terms of baseline ECOG performance status. Um, so looking at all of this, again, a very consistent signal as one would hope to see. Looking here at progression-free survival rates, again, still statistically significant. Six-year rates, 82.3 versus 74.5%. The hazard ratio is 0 0.68. So very similar to the prior data cuts that have been reported previously. Looking at treatment-related deaths here, so uh, total number of deaths in total, 39 on the experimental arm versus 64 on the ABVD arm. Uh, there is a higher number of deaths due to Hodgkin's lymphoma or complications in the ABVD arm, as well as also a higher number of deaths due to second malignancy, as you can see. A smattering of other causes, which appear similar. And again, this is very typical for this patient population where you'll see a number of typically random events, unknown accident or suicide, you know, COVID-19, a couple of uh, other medical events here. And so again, looking at the main focus, Hodgkin's lymphoma and its complications or second malignancies, clearly favoring the experimental arm. Looking at subsequent treatment, again, as the rate of relapse is lower in the experimental arm, you see fewer patients that go on to receive another line of therapy. And that's what this uh, table shows. When you look at the type of treatments that were given, again, brentuximab vedotin, so the idea of crossover, although this wasn't planned. So you see a BV in the control arm was given uh, potentially uh, relatively frequently. Uh, looking at the numbers, you can see 49 patients received monotherapy, 20 received it in combination with chemotherapy. I think the thing that we'd be a little more interested in to see typically in a younger patient population who goes on to receive a chance at uh, high-dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplant. So 59 patients in the uh, ABVD arm versus 44 in the AVD arm. You can see the number of allo transplants are uncommon though. Again, 12 in the uh, control arm versus four in the uh, experimental arm. And looking at immunotherapy, uh, maybe a little surprising to see relatively low numbers of patients receiving nivolumab or pembrolizumab in this clinical trial. Again, this may reflect the time that the patients were enrolled in the study and potentially the availability uh, at the time, which may have only been in clinical trial centers. And now we know that these drugs are often uh, available in the standard of care in multiple countries around the world, as this was an international trial. Looking here again at uh, second malignancies in a little more detail, so you can see that these were numerically more common in the control arm, 32 versus 23. Looking at the numbers, the darker colors look at second, uh, sorry, look at second malignancies uh, that were solid tumors, again, 14 and 14, but you see a higher number of hematologic malignancies in patients with ABVD versus uh, BVAVD. And looking at those, uh, you can see a number of uh, lymphomas, B or T cell lymphomas, as, as well as uh, myeloid uh, disorders as well, including leukemia and MDS. Looking at pregnancy here, so this is always challenging because uh, it's difficult to assess uh, fertility formally, particularly in a large study. We don't know what proportion of these patients might have been trying to become pregnant, but uh, 191 pregnancies reported, and you can see certainly nothing to suggest a detriment in the, uh, in the experimental arm at all. Looking at peripheral neuropathy, again, uh, looking at two years or of follow-up or longer, this still is a little more common in the experimental arm of BV with ABVD. When you look at the majority of those patients after six years of follow-up, you continue to see significant improvement. The median time to resolution, again, we know is very early. And so this would have occurred very early in the follow-up of these uh, 
these patients, but looking at long-term, it's really important to highlight both for the control arm where we can see grade one or grade two toxicity in 8% of patients still ongoing uh, versus 17% of patients in the experimental arm, though thankfully the majority of these were only grade one toxicity. This is something as you follow these patients uh, in your own practice, uh, when you ask these questions of patients, it is surprising to still see some of these uh, issues, though they may be minor ones in patients that are cured. So the author conclusion, so this is the first regimen to show an improvement in overall survival versus a standard ADVD in previously untreated uh, advanced classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. There was a variety of second line therapy that was used, including a, a good amount of BV in the control arm. Um, but it's also important to recognize that uh, the effect here in survival was also in part related to fewer second malignancies in the experimental arm versus a standard ADVD. The observed uh, survival as expected uh, tends to result from disease-related deaths and, and seeing lower numbers of that. And uh, the potential of cure, which as we know is not entirely related to overall survival when you start to think about secondary effects in Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so the authors conclude, uh, brentuximab in combination with ABD should be considered a preferred frontline treatment option for these patients with uh, untreated stage three or stage four classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so with that, uh, we're gonna draw to a conclude, conclusion, but uh, also focus a little bit on uh, how this may affect the Canadian practice. So I'd also like to share here that uh, as we look at the Canadian landscape for the treatment of uh, classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, as I mentioned to you earlier, there are a number of different platforms that investigators use. And that is why the conclusion here really highlighted the idea that uh, we must look at this as one of the treatment options and perhaps a preferred gold standard uh, given our uh, reliance in Canada as well on the uh, ABVD backbone traditionally. Now, the impact of looking at this, the simplicity of being able to avoid interim PET scanning, I think will be appealing to many of us. And the survival advantage in particular clearly shows that the incorporation of BV up front becomes an important question for us, particularly those of us that may consider using other strategies in higher risk patients. And so um, this may not uh, defer those of you who want to give escalated BCOP based approaches and de-escalate in a minority of patients that have high risk disease based on the uh, international prognostic score as an example. But for the majority of patients, and I think even for the, pa for the clinicians that may use a little bit of escalated BCOP, for the bulk of patients that will be uh, typically have been treated with ABVD in the beginning, this does provide a strong argument to consider all of those patients for uh, BV in combination with AVD given the survival data. And thankfully, no, uh, no uh, concerning uh, toxicity signals, a reassuring story here in large part about late effects. And while a peripheral neuropathy does remain a concern for a minority of these patients, the overall survival advantage and the disease control effect with the progression-free survival benefit remains maintained. And thus, I think this is very much a trial that will influence practice in the Canadian landscape. Thank you.